There we are. Yeah. Now we're cooking. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, who are you? Who are you? It's not an easy answer, uh, needy, not an easy question to answer. Not an easy thing for me to say either, huh? But who are you is not an easy question to answer, right? Because there is no one size fits all answer. And so that's why we're going to be taking an extensive look over these uh, next several uh, weeks to uh, look into Scripture and get a biblical perspective of all the facets and layers. Yes, layers, donkey, layers. Yes. We're going to take a look at all the facets and layers and dimensions of just who you are. Now, last week, we looked at John 3.16, and there we saw that you are loved, you are worthy, and you are welcome. Well, today we're going to stay in John chapter 3. We're going to continue on in verses 17 through 21. So uh, I encourage you to grab your Bibles. How many of you have your Bibles with you? All right, I see some shiny ones. I see some regular ones. Yeah. <laughs> Bring your Bibles. Make sure that I am preaching the Word. Okay? So we're looking at John chapter 3, verses 17 to 21. And let's go ahead and read those verses and see some more of just what God has to say about who you are. Are. So John 3, starting at verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. I'm going to take just a moment here before we dive into the sermon just to also remind you we do have our prayer bowl over here. Yes, the, the, the altar is open at any time during the service, and so is the prayer bowl. That's available for you as, where, as well. You can write down your prayer requests, place them in the bowl, and know that they will be prayed for this week and throughout the week that we will bring those before the Lord and He will hear. He will answer. We trust in a mighty God and we bring our prayers and our petitions to Him. So that's why we have this prayer bowl over here. So anytime during the service, by all means, write down your prayer request. Place it in the bowl so that we can pray for that during the week. Okay? All right, so back to John 3. 17 through 21. I have, as they say, good news and bad news. Okay, actually, I have three. I have, we'll start with the bad news. Then there's good news. And then there's great news. All right? There's bad news, good news, and great news. So, and by the way, thank you, everyone, for coming out on this cold, cold morning. We started our, our journey this morning. It was negative four is what the, the temperature, uh, the therm thermometer said on our car. And as we're driving along, I said, oh, look, it warmed up to negative five. <laughs> uh, the numbers were going up, but, you know, it was negative, so it was actually going down. So thank you all for coming out. For those who couldn't make it out and are watching online, we're welcome, we're, we're Glad to have you, and you're welcome as well, and we hope that, uh, that the presence of the Lord, as He has come and joined us this morning, that He is joining you wherever you are watching as well. 
All right, let's start off with the bad news from John 3, 17 through 21. In verses 17 and 18, there we find that you are condemned by your sin. That's the bad news. Without Christ, you stand condemned before God. There's no escaping it. He says, for God sent His Son not to condemn the world, because you're already condemned. Your sin has condemned you. But to save the world. That's why He came. He came to snatch us from death row. Why on earth would He do that? Well, we go back to verse 16, which we uh, spoke from last Sunday, and there we read about his immeasurable, how his great love, he so loved the world. But whoever believes in him is not condemned, right? If you want a more, a more full ex ex explanation of that, go back and watch last week's sermon on the, on the website. Okay, some good stuff there. But, God, but John is not pulling any punches in these verses, okay? Jesus didn't come to condemn the world because you're already condemned. So he goes on in verse 18 to say, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is or stands condemned already. You stand condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And then over in his letter to the churches, in, in or his first letter, in 1 John 5, 12, he writes, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Pretty straightforward. It's blunt, isn't it? But it's true. It's true. That's the way... It is, folks. It's, it's a binary choice. Either you have the Son or you don't have the Son. Either you have life or you don't have life. It's like pregnancy. Either you're pregnant or you're not. There's no being kind of pregnant, right? Either you are or you're not. It's like gender. Either you're male or you're female. Okay? Only two choices. One or the other. Male or female. Man or woman. Boy or girl. Only two genders. Not seven. Not 72. Not 932. Not even a thousand, as some people are claiming. And so it is, either you have life with Christ or you don't. Either you're alive in Christ or you're dead in your sins. Like Miracle Max says, there's a big difference between being all dead and mostly dead. How many got that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Princess Bride, a, a fantastic film. So... Um, so either you're still condemned to hell and eternal death or you're alive in Christ and you've been saved from death and risen to new life, an eternal life with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So who are you? If you're not with Christ, if Christ is not in you, bad news is that you are condemned by your sin. Well, what's the good news then? We've seen the bad news. What's the good news? The good news is that you are exposed by the light of the world. You are exposed by the light of the world. Verses 19 and 20. The light of the world. Jesus Christ has come. We celebrated Christmas just recently, and the Christmas season that extends up until actually last Sunday, called Epiphany Sunday, 
the day that we recognize that the three kings came uh, to, uh, to worship Jesus, sometimes called Three Kings Day, all right? But that, that's the Christmas season, and we just came through that Christmas season where we celebrated that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth. What a glorious light that is for all of us. And with the arrival of that light, your sin, your guilt, and your shame have been exposed. The light of Christ exposes our sin, guilt, and shame. Though those who decide to hide in the shadows rather than come into the light and stay in the light often choose to do so because of the evil, the hate, and or the fear that is in their hearts. The evil, the hatred, or the fear that's in their, in their hearts. So what is this? Someone who has evil in their hearts. These are people who are committed to opposing all that is good and pure and wholesome. Have you ever met anybody like that? Who will take any kind of comment that you make and turn it into some kind of sexual innuendo? Somebody who's always going to take your words and twist them to mean something other than what you meant. They're committed in their life to looking for those twisted ways to twist the good to evil, to twist the pure to impure, and the wholesome to filthy. That's, that's their mode of operation. That's how they live their lives. What about the people who have hate in their heart? A lot of people are wounded and scared. That's where a lot of hatred comes from because they're wounded. Sometimes they've been wounded by the church. I think at one point or another, we all have. We've been hurt by someone in the church, those who we thought we could open up to, those who we trusted. And they said something that, that hurt us, that wounded our hearts. And that's where hate comes in. Because we let that wound fester and we don't get it treated. And these people who are wounded and scared, they, they lash out like an animal that's in a corner. They'll lash out or they'll block people out. They won't let anybody in. And they act in hurtful and in dangerous behaviors. And we know people like that as well. Sometimes it's us. Then there are people who have fear in their hearts. These people are bound by familiar spirits. Bound by things that they think, like, oh, this is familiar to me. I don't want more of whatever this is that's in this church. I, I don't want to let go of what's familiar to me. And they won't venture out into new territory. They won't venture out to experience what God has, this newness of life in Christ. We see it in Scriptures. Take a look at, when, uh, at the gatherings. Remember when Jesus commanded the spirits out of the man who was possessed and told him to go into the pigs. And the pigs ran crazy and went, ran, ran over the, the cliff and, and just killed themselves just running over a cliff. And what did the Gadarenes do, the people of that town? They begged Jesus to leave because their normal their twisted sense of normal 
was to have a demon-possessed man roaming around naked in the, the cemetery and scaring people. That's what they had become accustomed to. That's what they were familiar with. And when something came along and changed all that, there was power exhibited to change all that. <gasps> we're afraid of that. We want, to, we want to go back to what is normal for us. How crazy is that? But that's what they wanted. And that's, they had fear in their hearts because this was something different. This was something new. This wasn't what they were familiar with. They would rather have this demon-possessed man in their midst than experience the freedom from evil spirits that Jesus offered. Because of these, the evil, the hatred, and the fear, many people do not want to let this light of Christ shine on them. And so they hide in the shadows. They don't want their sins exposed. They don't want to be outed. Or they don't want to have to change. But Numbers 32 verse 23 tells us, you may be sure that your sin will find you out. You may be sure. There's no doubt about it. Your sins will be outed because it has been exposed by the light of the world in Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what the light of Christ does. It exposes us. And it brings conviction to our hearts. And conviction can be a good thing. It's not bad because Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but to bring us new life, right? To save the world. So ready or not, your sins are exposed by the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And what's the good news or the great news then? We've looked at the bad news that you're condemned. We've looked at the good news that your sin is exposed. And now the, good, the great news is that you are purified and prospered by the light of the world. Purified and prospered. If you hide in the shadows, you stand, stand condemned by your sins. But if you step into the light, and that same light will, will expose your sin. It'll actually also act as a purifying and a prospering agent. Because light has more qualities, qualities than just illumination, than just lighting up the uh, the, the, the scene here, right? The light will also bleach and disinfect, right? Have you ever had a paper and you set it out on the desk and the light came through the window and you, you, you left it there where that light would shine on it day by day and day by day that document, whatever it is, that piece of paper got lighter and lighter and pretty soon you couldn't even read the print that was on the page. Heard of a fellow who, who left a, something on the table by the, by the window and it, it bleached it out and then he went to the closet and he began to dig around in the boxes, and his wife said, what in the world are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for our marriage certificate. <laughs> that was not a happy day in that house. <laughs> that was not me. <laughs> Let's get that clear. But light will bleach and disinfect those who live by the truth choose to step into the light. They're going to come out of the darkness. They're going to step into the light and say, God, my sin is already exposed. Purify me. Take it away. 
I don't want this darkness in my life anymore. Let your light purify me. Let it disinfect me. Let it cleanse me. Those who recognize this grace of God in their lives from the light of the world, they recognize also that there is this purifying effect that conviction can have. As we said, conviction is a good thing. Because if you know the truth of God's grace, you know He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to save you. He wants to save you from those destructive behaviors and in those self-defeating thoughts. So don't hide from the the light. Don't hide from this sin-exposing light of Christ. Instead, step into the light and let Him Let him do that purifying work that he has for you. Experience more of his grace. Experience more of his mercy. Experience more of his love. Because he didn't come to condemn you, he came to save you. And light also promotes growth. That's the prosper, uh, that's the prospering that he wants to do in you. He wants to spiritually prosper you to cause spiritual growth in you. Light promotes growth. Well, that's nothing new, Dave. You know, we've, we've all either worked on a farm or had a garden. We all know that light promotes growth. Well, in the same way, the light of Christ promotes growth in our hearts. Don't ever be satisfied with partial growth. What's the saying about, uh, about the raising corn? It gets knee, it's supposed to be knee-high by the 4th of July, right? What if it stayed there at knee-high? Yeah, you'd freak out. Like, what's going on? We're not going to have our harvest. We're not going to be able to pay our mortgage. We're not going to be able to feed the kids because it's not producing the corn that it's supposed to. It's just staying there. What's going on? Don't settle for knee-high growth in your spiritual life either. Don't settle for that. Don't settle for less than what God has intended for you. What He wants to accomplish in you and through you and for you. Don't ever let your soul say, well, I'm not all that God wants me to be, but at least I'm not the man I used to be, or I'm not the woman I used to be. No! No! I plead with you, no! Don't settle for at least. If you settle for at least, least is what you're going to get. Don't ever settle for least. Always strive, always desire more of God. More of what He wants in your life. More of the growth so that you can reach the potential of who God created you to be. Don't settle. Don't settle for at least. Recognize that the progress you have made has been done by God, but also recognize there's more. Yes, just like the commercials, but wait, there's more, right? Don't settle. He wants to do so much more. Philippians 4, excuse me, 1, 6, Philippians 1, 6 says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on. It will continue. He'll carry it on and on. He wants to continually work in you. And He'll carry it on to uh, till you're good enough. Eh, you know, till you're knee high. 
No, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He wants to continually work in you and grow you so that you can be all that you can be in Christ. Yes, you've seen changes in your life already, and that's great. But there's more. There's more. There's so much more that God has for you. There's so much more that God wants to do in you and through you. There's more of that cleansing and purifying to be done. There's more instruction and personal growth to be done. There's more good works to be done in our community and around the world. There are so many more people to be reached. There are millions of people in this world who have never heard the name of Jesus. We need to go out and reach them. They are the unreached. We need to reach them with the message of the gospel. There's so many more ways that God wants to gift you with spiritual gifts so that you can have a greater kingdom impact. These are the ways that God wants to grow you. These are the ways that God wants to prosper you. So step into the light and let God do His work. Step into the light in a posture with your hands extended of surrender, in a posture of receiving from God all that He has for you. Don't you want more of God? Don't you want to know His fullness in your life? Step into the light. Receive the prospering work that God wants to do for you. Who are you? Who are you? John tells us in these verses that, number one, you're condemned by your sin. But number two, you're exposed by the light of the world. The light of the world has come. And that's a good thing. And even better, the greater thing is that you are purified and prospered by the light of the world. If you'll step into that light and let that light do its work in you. So let me ask you this morning, where do you stand before God? Where do you stand before God right now? Where you're sitting? Where do you stand before God? Are you still committed to sinful and destructive behaviors and a, a way of life that is in opposition to God without any concern for the condemnation that you will receive when you stand before the great King and Judge of all? And somebody just laugh about that. Oh, I'm going to hell, but you know, all my friends will be there. Let me tell you, folks, you have no idea, no idea of the level of torment that you will experience there, that you're headed for. And it's in your best interest to turn your life over to Christ. And allow Him and His light to work in you. Maybe you're aware of your sin. Your sin has been exposed and you're, you've been made aware of it. But you're still trying to hide in the shadows. You're still not wanting to be outed. Don't want people to know, oh, I still have this sin in my life. People think I'm, I'm so good because I go to church. Maybe you're still trying to hide in the shadows. Do you have a sense that there is evil or hatred or fear in your heart? Don't try to hide. Allow God to convict you 
so that he can bring to light what needs to change. Because Jesus didn't send, or God did not send Jesus to condemn you. That light is not to condemn you, but it is to save you. And maybe you are ready to stand in the light. Maybe you're saying, yeah, I, I need this. I need to stand in the light. I, I've been trying to hide for so long, and I'm ready today to stand in the light. and Let God do a purifying and prospering work in my life. Then I encourage you to come forward as well. Let Christ do His cleansing work in you to cleanse you from those remaining sinful habits and thoughts and let Him prosper you with personal growth and gifts for ministry. I'm going to ask Jen if she'll come and play a song for us and we're going to open up the altar. If you feel the, the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart today that there is sin that condemns you, that there's sin that you're still trying to hide. Maybe you're saying, oh, I'm so ready. I need to step into the light and let God purify me and let him prosper me. Come on down and, and let's pray. If there are other needs you have, come on down as well. We want to pray with you. The, the, the leaders of this church are a praying group and they want to pray over you and with you and walk through this time of confession and of conviction and of trusting and of turning over your life to Christ. So if you feel the need to come and pray, come on and do so. We'll be happy to meet you here at the altar.